Hello, lovely podcast people. Welcome to another episode of Not Another Nutrition Podcast. Just before I begin, I want to say a big thank you because recently I have been regularly appearing in the top four, top five nutrition podcasts in Great Britain. And um, it's just quite cool. Uh, It's quite nice to see that happening. There's some other weird stuff. I was top 100 in business and technology. Lucy updates me with these stats, by the way. I don't um, go check in. She does all this. Uh, But she just mentioned this funny one, business and technology in Ireland. (laughs) Not entirely sure how that happens. But all over the world, Ecuador, I was number one. Thanks, my Ecuadorian listeners. Whichever episodes suddenly boosted that up. But yeah, just a big thank you for everyone who is. No one really knows how these ratings are done. So uh, it's people say, like, this is what I said. I'll do another little plea. What episode are we on now? Like roughly episode 30-ish. And um, thank you very much. Thank you for your reviews. Uh, and just a reminder, martin-mcdonald.com forward slash EP30, episode 30. Uh, EP30. Uh, You can do that with any episode. EP29 for episode 29. EP13 for episode 13. EP17 for episode 17. I I won't go through them all. Hopefully, from that description, you can work out where it is. It's a bit like percentages. When I teach percentages to people, um, and it's amazing how many people really struggle with numeracy, I uh, I almost considered doing like a maths add-on bolt-on module. Uh, I really like maths; have always always been very good at it, and uh, and I actually really enjoy teaching it. And so, within our case studies residential, we do a little bit of mathematics. Even within M and U, some lectures I end up doing a bit of teaching. Just I, I feel like I was blessed with very. I had one very very good maths teacher, and then I was also blessed with a dad who encouraged me in maths and was very good and inspired me. But people, if you've had a bad maths teacher, it screws you for life a little bit. Uh, um, And uh, when you understand something really well, I I find it's often easier to explain it. So anyway, (coughs) when, you know, talking about percentages, how do you work out 17%, you know, times it by 0.17, 28%, oh, tricky one, times it by 0. Anyway, where was I? Thank you very much for everyone. So where the ratings come from is like uh, people subscribing. So if you do have an iPhone, if you have the podcast app, please just go click subscribe on there. If you want to give back a little bit, people say, oh, how can I thank you? I can't thank you enough. Yes, you can. Thank me enough by going and clicking subscribe. Even if you can just find if your girlfriend or boyfriend or wife or husband has an iPhone and you don't, go on their phone and leave a review. Uh, It all helps. Clicking the subscribe button seems to help, but it's mainly just you guys listening. I think that's the main factor that affects it. How many people are downloading and listening to the podcast regularly makes a big difference. And so recently, a lot of you have been sticking the podcast and yourself listening to it on social media and writing a little caption to encourage friends and family to go listen. So I really appreciate that. And I just wanted to start by thanking you because it's much appreciated. The podcast is currently my favorite, most enjoyable endeavor w- within my working life, even though it's not really work, um, in that, in so much as it's not my job and doesn't <laughs> put food on the table, but it's cool and it's all part of my bigger why and for what I do and what I enjoy doing. So, this podcast, and actually is going to probably end up being several podcasts, at least three, I would think on creatine i went through it's a listener questions podcast sorry i'm probably not going to mention anyone by name because it came up so often in different people i went through the suggestions thing so you can go on the website martin-mcdonald.com forward slash n-a-n-p for not another nutrition podcast and you can go and suggest questions if you haven't before and the better you do the more likely it will come up. So many of you have asked about menopause. So I put on my Instagram story today, I will be doing a bigger feature on menopause. It will be bigger and it will be better because I want to do it well. It's something I always get asked about. It's something that I have only ever lectured on, presented on once. Um, But it's an area where really just some simple myth busting really, really helps people. The other one that came up was breastfeeding. (laughs) Very female 
dominated topics, probably because my f following is uh, predominantly female. Uh, and then reverse dieting. So those are three that you guys have asked so many questions. So I'll probably prompt you guys to go in and just bolster those episodes with any questions because I want them to be complete and I'll do them very well, I hope. Anyway, on to creatine. Uh, James Smith once called me the creatine guy and sadly it's stuck. <laughs> um, so thanks, James. Uh, it's quite cool though. It's like having a nickname in school. I always wanted a nickname. I, I never got called Mac. <coughs> My little sister is called Mac. No one ever called me Mac. I would love to have been had a nickname. Uh, right, let's talk about creatine. Creatine is just one of those supplements. The reason I got called the creatine guy is just because I did some posts on it. And it's just a hugely, well, it's one, it's one of, if not the most studied ergogenic aids, a uh, supplement that can improve performance in a variety of ways but it also can help health. And, um, you know, I, I started my mum on creatine when she hit about 60-ish, maybe a bit before, 50-ish. And for a variety of reasons that I will discuss uh, during some of these podcasts. So I'm going to call this first podcast probably either Introduction to Creatine or Creatine and Body Composition because so many of the questions related to body composition and for muscle gain, and I'll discuss fat loss as well, because there's a bit, but, but there's also lots of misconceptions. So I think I'll probably at some point, whether at the end of one of the episodes, just wrap up with some of the misconceptions so that you guys don't believe those. And then obviously I'll need to have a section on sort of how to use it effectively, just a nice short explainer on how and why and when and that kind of jazz. Um, but I just wanted to start talking about fat loss and muscle gain, body composition essentially, as just a really nice, super easy intro to creatine. And actually, I've just realised I've not. I'll also, I'll probably do a separate one, which is like which creatine to take, how to, you know, because there are different types that people are bringing about. And um, yeah, I think that would be helpful, wouldn't it? And <clears throat> maybe within that one, I'll briefly explain what creatine is creatine monohydrate, which is the one that is the most studied and the one that I would always recommend. There you go, I've already taken that away from the following podcast. Uh, and just kind of the how it works. The problem is with explaining the how it works is it it works in a different way depending on the goal or the facet that I'm talking about. So like the more recent stuff which I'm fascinated by is its role in um, within my clinical nutrition studies, I did some stuff on uh, neurodegenerative disorders, and I focus more on omega-3s, but obviously you come across the creatine research. And um, it's just super interesting when you start to find out, oh my goodness, there's creatine deposits in the in the brain. Um, I say deposits, there's creatine stores, sometimes they become de deposits like in Alzheimer's, um, which are maybe not so good. I might discuss that as well, geez. Um, but yeah, creatine and kind of healthy aging, cognition, memory uh, can be improved with creatine in certain situations, which is super cool. And then obviously the main one, uh, which is kind of sports performance, gym performance. I'll probably talk a little bit, yeah, in this one about gym performance and how obviously that then relates to muscle gain, for instance. But yeah, it's it's a super interesting area. And And one thing with my podcast, one of the reasons I choose to do it in the way I do it. And I'm trying to stick to this thing of not overthinking stuff too much. Now I will remind you, martinmcdonald.com forward slash EP30 and, and, and whenever on. That's where I will link you to references. If you're the type of person who wants references, you can click that, you know, go to that link and get the references. I'll hyperlink them um, and, and any kind of resources I, I mention. So yeah, I want to just often provide a grounding for you to be aware of stuff, to bust some myths. So for instance, concussion. I remember back probably 2010, 11, 12-ish, hearing someone speak on some super complicated, um, it was at the ISCNC conference and a guy was speaking about creatine and rugby players, I think it was. And so I can just hear some stuff outside my podcast room. I just want to see 
how strange. I could hear loads of noise. We won't cut that out. Um, I thought maybe Frankie or someone was outside the room coming to tell me something important. She was listening. Anyway, it was put, putting me off. I remember, so concussion. And uh, again, I just want to kind of bring it to the forefront that creatine has implications within um, concussion in rugby players. And, and, and it just led me down this road of thinking of, you know what, rugby players, I, I've been involved with uh, performance nutrition of young athletes and I've done some work with kind of private schools, public schools, depending on what part of the world you're in, and uh, where they had lots of rugby scholars. But then they were like, can you come in and tell them, do not take supplements, we have a complete anti-supplement um, policy, which is stupid. Don't have an anti-supplement policy. Uh, have a well-rounded, informed decisions-based policy, you gimps, which is what I went in and told them. Like with most things in life, um, we won't go there. Goodness me, that would open up a can of worms if I started down that tangent, wouldn't it? But for instance, you're you're allowing your 16-year-old um, son or daughter to play a sport where you get smacked in the head and um, creatine may well actually benefit situations like that. Like, again, for when, maybe I'll discuss this a bit more. I don't know within the sports performance type element when I discuss that. But, you know, MMA, we just get kicked in the head. People shinning people in the face repeatedly. My goodness, what a brutal sport. So, yeah, this scenario of like, no, creatine, you know, you might be allowing them to to do this sport, which could be damaging to their brain, but they're not giving them a supplement that might actually benefit them. Anyway, I just want to kind of lay that out there. There's there's just, there's some really interesting research, and it is difficult, uh, a bit like the Alzheimer's research, very difficult research to do, but they've, they've studied in children and adolescents with regards to, to traumatic brain injury. We're talking serious injury, and uh, quite high relative doses, um, not point um, four grams per kilogram, I think. Which you know, daily, you know, twenty twenty kilogram individual child. That's eight grams a day, which is quite a lot. I thought. Anyway, considering a maintenance dose for an adult is, it, you know, loading doses like twenty grams. Yeah, but you can maintain and once you've loaded, like on three grams ish. Anyway, I'm going off topic. But really, really, really interesting results in terms of reduced time with amnesia, um, reduction in kind of damage to the brain, and and just re like all, all of the complications that people see within um, concussion seem to be improved, which is, I don't know, I find quite astounding. Um and so, you know, and, and we're talking. I don't, I don't know the research well, so I don't know if it's like um, car crashes or, or what that they're studying exactly. But with creating supplementation, you know, aggressive creating supplementation, reducing the the disabling effects of such injury, um, reducing length of stay in the ICU, like all all of that kind of stuff. It, it is quite astounding results. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not trying to educate you. I'm not trying to uh, too much. I'm just trying to give you this idea that this exists. Because if any one of my listeners was unfortunate enough to have a child uh, in that situation, I just would want them to be able to ask an informed question uh, and maybe get you know, a consultant to consider that a, as a possible option with seemingly no downsides to that. Um, so anyway, going back to what this podcast is supposed to be about, which is hypertrophy, fat loss, gym performance type scenarios. So it, this is going to be quick. No, I've said that before. <laughs> um, <laughs> geez, why do I do it? Put myself off. Uh, because it's so simple, creating the, a very, very basic function of creatine is for our creatine phosphate system. It's one of our energy systems and we are able to recycle 
ATP. We're able to create more energy directly inside our muscle for doing repetitions in the gym. And obviously for hypertrophy to occur, one of the things we want to be doing is lifting weights. And we want to be lifting them well and we want to be progressing. And that's what one of the easily understandable mechanisms of creatine is. And so you get all of these different studies that have shown this over the last 30 to 40 years, um, showing, giving us insights into this. Interestingly, uh, I can't remember the paper, but I will link it for you. I think it's in Jose Antonio's lab, actually. Yeah, it is. No, I can't remember. Uh, but it was a study that basically looked at upper versus lower limb gains. And uh, the creatine versus not without creatine, you gained more muscle. But interestingly, there's seemingly a bit greater gains in the upper body for whatever reason um, that was. And why am I telling you that? Because everyone wants a, to be more jacked and bench more and no one cares about legs. But actually for saying that, for, for uh, you know, I'm joking, by the way. I know lots of people want bigger legs, more muscular legs and... Uh, Sos creatine will help, but not as much as it helped me get big biceps, seemingly. Uh, so anyway, other studies, there's a very, very recent study, a 2020 study. Again, cannot remember the author, apologies. Uh, but I'll link you it. <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying that. That's like my, my fallback. Uh, 2017, actually, there you go. That's the upper lower study. And the author begins with N. Uh, that's just popped into my head. Uh, N something, 2017, there you go. The 2020 study is really interesting uh, because it didn't manage to show, and actually I've just remembered, I think it was only a six week study, the 2020 study, and it's difficult, right? Muscle gain, these are natural athletes, um, I can't remember how well trained they were, but they only supplemented for six weeks. 20, um, and yeah, actually this is a really weird study that I'm thinking of. They basically showed increased strength, great, significantly increased in the creatine group versus, I believe it was a placebo, um, and significantly increased muscular endurance. And um, they didn't manage to show significant increases in, in muscle mass, so hypertrophy. But in a six-week study, that's difficult to show. So... But what's really funny about that study is this is from some of my more geeky listeners, but they supplemented with something like 0.003 grams per kilogram or something like that um, of creatine. Th this was in the method. After every set of an 18 set workout program, so whatever. Yeah, it's like 18 times 0 0.0003, roughly. I can't actually do that in my head. Um, or can I? Anyway, it works out as just under 0 0.1 grams per kilogram. 0.099 or something grams per kilogram. Uh, maybe it's 0 0.0005. Anyway, the point being, it's just a bizarre study. Have some creatine after every set of a gym workout program. Uh... Anyway, there you go. It was just a bizarre, I just remember reading and going, WTF? Why? Uh, and I'll talk about when the best time is to take it uh, in, a, in a later episode. So uh, th that's the long and short of it, to be honest. Creating time and time again shows us. And actually, I I'm going to talk about older adults. I wanted this one, first one to be short, and I'm, I'm just going to wrap it up. Uh, older adults, creatine in the elderly is massive. Cognition, the teeny, 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 tiny bit of early preliminary data suggesting it might help in Alzheimer's. Um, just also, and then, and then and all sorts of things with regards to elderly and muscle function, even without resistance training. Anyway, I'll, we'll go there um, another time. So... Gym performance, creatine, take it. If you're resistant training, flip and take it. Like, or don't. It's not magic, but it'll just enhance your gains. It'll help you recover better. If you are training, if you are, unless you are doing something where your body weight is, a, is an issue uh, and you don't want to gain any muscle mass, but then your tr tr training really needs to dictate that. Like, the training is what is pulling the trigger. 
So if you are training in a way that elicits muscle mass gain and you don't want to gain muscle mass and gain weight, that's your fault for tr training wrong. Now creatine might cause an acute gain in body weight which is to do with creating, going inside your muscles and ca causing an increase in intracellular water. Um, so, yes, one of the side effects of creatine, which I'll cover when I talk a little bit about sort of concerns and myths, this whole thing, oh, it makes me watery, like I felt really puffy. Uh, you know, I had abs and then I took creatine and uh, I no longer have abs, so I think creatine made me so watery, so I'm not taking it anymore. You know, said every gimp on the internet ever since I was about 16 years old. Um, it's not true. And you know what? When I, when I was about 16, I think that was when I first tried creatine, I went to Holland and Barrett's, and the creatine they had, some of you, uh, I know it's super cool, right? I still have people who have been sort of following me for about probably nearing 20 years uh, because I, I was an early adopter of internet forums and just geeked out on nutrition, was discussing, you know, supplements 20 years ago. And I'm still a kid, really. I'm definitely a kid in my mind, but I'm still young-ish, right? Uh, but yeah, I remember, and some of you will remember this, the fruit punch flavored Holland and Barrett creatine, which had like a billion grams of carbohydrate per five grams. Because this is this whole thing about loading and taking it with sugar for an insulin spike. But legitimately, it was like 40 or 80 grams of sugar per scoop and and five grams of creatine. So it was like an 85 gram scoop and you got 80 grams of sugar and five, and then you did a loading dose of four of those a day. So like, yeah, of course, if you're smashing all of that sugar, which is obviously non-satiating on top of all your other calories that you're eating and whatnot, yeah, you maybe did lose your abs, but it wasn't the flipping creatine. It was the 80,000 grams of sugar that you were consuming a week because you were loading creatine. Um, what that was meant, and it tasted disgusting, that fruit punch flavor. Um, anyway, where was I? Uh, so some of those myths around it. So yeah, creatine helps you in the gym, um, incre you know, increases some body weight uh, through muscle mass over time through some intracellular water, which will just happen, but will then dissipate if you stop creatine for around 30 days, any increase in body weight, which doesn't matter. But bearing in mind, this leads me on to this discussion around fat loss. Uh, you know, if you're tracking scale weight, you need to bear in mind in the first seven to 30 days, depending on how you take your creatine, there will be a gradual increase in body weight. So if you're losing um, a kilo a month, then you and you start, you know, on average on a fat loss period and you start taking creatine and you gain two kilos in that first month, your body weight might go up by one kilo. So just bearing that in mind. And that might be when I come to dosing, that might be a reason to load, do a hard load on creatine because then you get all of the weight gain out of the way in the first seven days. So you can kind of normalize and get back to normal, uh, get back to kind of consistent tracking as it were i think maybe that noise was the radiators it's flipping hot in here i think i've still got the rate oh yeah wow still got the radiators on like winter uh, alexa what's the temperature outside at the moment it's eight degrees celsius oh it's not that tonight but it's you can expect a i didn't ask degree. didn't ask about tonight uh but thank you anytime <laughs> so increases really interesting actually so it will benefit your training performance so you can get you, you know you might have been getting eight reps or 10 reps on an exercise and now you get 12 and therefore over time that's progressive overload and you'll build some new muscle etc there is also some evidence of an acute increase in just absolute strength with taking creatine which is interesting again which will help with muscle mass gain and then you know, muscle endurance time and time again showing that. And when I talk about kind of sports performance, we'll talk about kind of repeated sprints being improved through creatine supplementation and stuff like that. Um, interestingly, actually, and I'm not hot, I'll be honest, I'm not hot on this research, but I am aware of one or two studies that have looked at 
essentially muscle damage as a result of exercise, as a result of like eccentric exercise. So if you're not aware of what eccentric means, it means lengthening a muscle under force. So when you lower a weight, often do a bicep curl, lower the weight, that's the eccentric portion. So then you can overload that with more weight and the eccentric portion often damages the muscle more. It little insight actually, I, I was chatting to James Krieger a couple of years ago when he came over to the UK and we had a long drive from the airport and uh, we were chatting about (laughs) one of his favourite topics, uh, volume, training volume. (laughs) There's been a lot of internet spats off some of the stuff that he's done. His stuff's good and then people get angry that he publishes stuff that questions their bias. Um, But I was chatting to him. One of the things that I did with my own tricep training obviously people know me for my triceps which is a bit weird because they're not that good in the in the grand scheme of things but they're just a big body part for me there's other things i wish were bigger instead anyway where was i (laughs) uh you guys love those some of you do i'm just trying to get rid of the karens if i'm totally honest and the zanoons uh but is reducing my eccentric portion of my training. If I want to train, get more volume for my tricep training, if I'm doing stuff where there's, you know, the triceps are in a stretched position under load, um, which for instance, I'm now for you YouTube watchers, you can see what I'm doing, you audio listeners can't, but an overhead tricep extension, your tricep is in a more stretched position. So there's kind of more stress in the, on the sort of eccentric portion. And, you know, on an uh, on an observational level do that exercise most people will report a greater level of doms the next day oh man it's so hot in here i'm gonna have to turn down the heating um and so i did less of that and did more uh where it was in a shorter position just push down so i could basically train my triceps more often more volume more weight etc and um, it, it was good for me anyway going back to creatine and muscle damage, sorry, uh, eccentric portion, showing reduced levels of muscle damage. And also when you damage your muscle, when you train, the amount of force that your muscle can then produce, there's some crazy studies where they make you run downhill fast on a treadmill just to F up your legs. Literally just, it's, you can't walk the next day after doing these studies, it's horrific. And then there's different interventions that they can do. So in the, uh, in the Cherry, Montgomery Cherry research, they do that a lot with regards to DOMS and, and, and muscle damage. And, but recovery of force production with creatine, there are some studies that, that show that. And likewise, reductions in markers of muscle damage like um, uh, creatine kinase. I, don't, I can't think if there's anything on C-reactive protein or, or like inflammation type stuff but i'm just aware of the area so it's just another thing for those of you geeking out realistically what's the what's the take home of this podcast if you want to get jacked or improve gym performance take creatine there you go goodbye thanks very much there there and and so this takes me to my final point which is fat loss lots of people shy away from using creatine during a fat loss phase which is silly other than Maybe in an instance with a coach not wanting to tell a client who they know is maybe a bit, they're still going through and or they should be going through a period of getting them away from obsessing about scale weight, really obsessing. And so taking creatine might mess them up until they get it right. But you should be able to get a client or yourself to a position where from a knowledge, knowledgeable standpoint, I'm going to take creatine and it's going to do, it might do roughly this to my body weight, therefore I'm ready for that outcome and it not send you off um, and on a spiral of distress. So creatine is not anti-fat loss. It, it very much, it will help you train better. It will help you train harder. It will help you recover better, etc. So therefore creatine is an excellent addition to any fat loss um, program that isn't obsessed with body weight for instance when i have worked with weight making athletes we have to pay attention to creatine because of the uh effects on body weight uh when i was working with uh elite olympic level hurdlers 400 meter hurdlers 
we had to pay attention to creatine and body weight because of all of the different impacts on their biomechanics, on their stride, on you know running over a hurdle at a billion miles an hour. Uh, yeah, so it's not anti-fat loss. Take it during your fat loss phases. But it's not going to directly, I suppose I'll finish with that, it's not going to directly impact fat loss. It's not directly impacting energy balance other than might make you train a bit harder. Fantastic. Um, right. I don't think that's been that long. I know there was a few tangents. I'm interested to see how long I've been talking for. But I will be back to talk to you about other stuff that I've mentioned. The brain, creatine in the brain, creatine in sports performance, exactly how to take creatine and when for optimal results. Um, so, you know, certain issues when you can and can't take it, some myths and that kind of jazz. Jeez, there, there might be quite a few episodes on this. I hope you enjoy them and uh, share them around if you wouldn't mind. Leave me some reviews on iTunes. I would love you very much for that. Enjoy reading those, the nice ones. Um, cool. Until next time. Much love.